And today, I have the bee lady herself, Alexandra Marsh, who's well known for the Lexington Bee Company. Honey bees are certainly the most important pollinators for our gardens and agriculture, and she's gonna tell us more about it. So Alex, take it away. Thank you, Ashley. Um, as Ashley mentioned, I, I have been a beekeeper for uh, some time, and what I'm gonna tell you today is not a lot about beekeeping. Learning beekeeping is kind of like learning French. You can't do it in an hour. But what I wanna tell you about is beekeeping in Lexington, and there's a lot more interest in beekeeping than there used to be. So I'm gonna tell you about the process of beekeeping to see if you might be interested in beekeeping or maybe not. Um, I have a slide presentation, which I'll start. Okay, this is a, uh, a picture of me. Um, I have been beekeeping since I started as a high school student in Lexington High in the 70s. I was inspired by one of our great biology teachers at Lexington High. Um, and I, I, my soft mentors, and I've been beekeeping on and off in Lexington since the 70s. Um, I now, um, my daughter and I, there's a picture on the left, we are the Lexington Bee Company. That's our website, lexingtonbee.com. And what we do is provide bees free for town and nonprofit properties um, like the Idlewild Community Garden and the Cotton Farm Orchard and the Interfaith Garden. And also uh, we keep bees for private uh, parties as well. If you want bees in your garden, we have private clients in Lexington. Um, I do help some of my private clients uh, learn about beekeeping. And I'm going to give you some of the considerations if you're interested in beekeeping, uh, why you might be interested and why beekeeping is such a, a wonderful avocation. Um, here are some products of the hive and obviously the, uh, the most, the one that most people are interested in is local honey and I've got a couple of pictures of my local honey in my kitchen up there on the left. Um, they are coming up with more and more scientific e evidence that the pollen that comes in the honey is very beneficial um, for the health, particularly if you're suffering from any kind of local allergies or hay fever. If you eat the honey, honey is basically flower nectar boiled down by the bees with a little bit of the local pollen in it, and it really builds up the immunity. And people have been keeping bees for at least 7,000 years and using everything that comes out of a beehive. The other obvious thing is on the, on the left are the beeswax candles, which were largely used in the history of Lexington. And then I've got a picture of um, one thing I made for Valentine's Day was chocolate covered, um, chocolate bees, which are honey filled. And they were delicious. That's nice. Um, but here's the, the um, one of the real reasons that we're keeping bees on the town properties and that people want bees in their neighborhood. And this is my favorite quote from my friend here in Lexington, Carla Fortman, who many of you probably know. Uh, this is her house, which is on Harrington Road, right downtown Lexington on the back of Lexington Green. And she has, you, you can't see it when you see her house from Lexington Green, but she has almost an acre behind her. And she has the interfaith garden, which you can see there in the background, uh, which is about half an acre and uh, people volunteer and then the, the food goes to the food pantries. And Carla is a very meticulous person and she keeps a chart of how much produce they pick and give to the food, guard, the food pantry every week. And she weighs it all and she has this beautiful chart that shows a thousand pounds, a thousand pounds, a thousand pounds every year, and then they got bees, and then it goes to 2,000 pounds, and it stays at 2,000 pounds. Um, so the, basically the produce doubled in the interfaith garden. So I keep bees there um, as, as well as the other places, and, and it's really had an impact on the garden. Um, 
and, and you can also do things that you can't necessarily find. Here in the United States, we tend to like the liquid honey in Europe for reasons that I can talk about later. They generally, Canada and Europe, uh, they generally have creamed honey, which is delicious. It's a consistency of butter and it's very fine crystals. It's a very mellow flavor. There's nothing different about it except for the form. And uh, this is the creamed honey that I made. And I enter my uh, honey and my beeswax products in contests in Massachusetts. And this is the Eastern Apiculture Society, which is an annual conference of um, everyone in, in the Eastern United States comes and competes. And uh, beekeepers are, are very social these days, which is wonderful because we have a lot of issues and problems that we have to discuss uh, among beekeepers and we all get together and talk about it. Now, uh, I'm gonna tell you why to forget about it, why you might not want to keep bees. And um, the, the, one of the nice things is that people think I'm cool now. Back in the 70s, they thought I was some kind of weirdo keeping bees. Um, and now I tell people, oh, I keep bees, and they say, oh, that's great. And my daughter started the Lexington High School Bee Club, which I now mentor. Uh, she was president, she, uh, she's a, off to college now, but um, she said on the day one with the college, uh, with the, the high school club fair, over 100 students signed up. Young people are very interested in beekeeping, and um, I am, passionate about trying to inspire these young people as the Lexington High School biology teacher inspired me. Uh, bees are under unprecedented pressure now. While people are more interested in bees, I have the long view of things because I've been keeping bees for more than 40 years now, and it is far harder to keep bees now than it ever was in uh, the history of the United States. And these are the top four reasons, I think, on, on why it's very difficult and, and why uh, people will often just hire me to keep the bees. Um, the, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Uh, yeah, okay, you can. Um, here's bee enemy number one, this thing, this brown thing on the upper left. That's a varroa mite. And... Uh, as you may have heard, we are getting infested with the Africanized bees in America. They've come up as far as the southern states now. We don't have them here in Massachusetts yet. But with the, uh, with the Africanized bees came these mites, and now they are everywhere in the world except for Australia, and I think they might have started finding them in Australia as well. And they are a killer for bees. Uh, they are a tiny mite that sucks the blood of the bees and will eventually kill the hive. They're a very deadly parasite, and now we have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money uh, treating our bees to get rid of varroa mites, which we all have. And it's, it's very difficult because bees are arthropods, and so are the varroa mites. So it's basically, it's not like killing a tick on a dog, which is an arthropod on a mammal. This is killing a tiny arthropod on a larger arthropod. So it's a question of degree. We use uh, these acaricides or miticides. And if you use too much, you kill the bee. If you use too little, you don't kill the mite. So that's a very difficult issue. And that's the reason that a lot of uh, beekeepers have gone out of business is because they just can't keep the bees alive with this. Um, the other reason is my display of, of money up here. It's, it's far more expensive to keep bees than it ever is. A beginner kit will cost you about $500 just for the equipment. And in the springtime, beekeeping is like gardening. You start in the spring and it runs through the summer and then the bees are essentially dormant over the winter. Um, and the bees themselves will cost you anywhere from $150 to uh, $250 to buy the initial bees and the queen. Um, and then there's the, the bottom left, the time. It takes far more time than it ever has to keep your bees alive. You have to be pretty vigilant. It's not like keeping a dog. It's not an everyday thing. 
but uh, I am in my bees at least once a week during the season. So you really have to dedicate uh, substantial time and money to doing this. And then the, the final top reason is this is a scene uh, from a movie, which actually I haven't seen, but it's called The Neighbors. And uh, starting in Boston and radiating out, towns are getting stricter and stricter about keeping bees. And here in Lexington, uh, I work very closely with the Conservation Commission. And, uh, also, and I've also worked with the Boards of Health and uh, I'm the chairman of the Massachusetts Beekeepers Association Legislative Committee. And we try to work with towns. Um, all towns have a nuisance law and in my opinion, that should take care of it. But because neighbors are starting to complain, because there's a lot of people who are starting beekeeping and, and, may, and the neighbors are getting concerned, a lot of towns have set up very strict and onerous regulations. For example, in Watertown, if you want to keep bees, you have to submit a plot plan and notify all of your neighbors and have a hearing. And essentially, um, any of your neighbors can say, well, I don't want to live near bees. And, and, and then you're, you've got a problem. You may not be able to do it. And right now in Cambridge, uh, the Massachusetts Beekeepers Association and some of my beekeeper friends are working on a case right now where someone had their permit pulled simply because a neighbor said, I don't want to live next to bees. Now, people have been bee beekeeping uh, in the United States for 300 years. They're not indigenous to the United States. They were brought in from Europe. Bees are native to Europe and Eastern Europe and, and um, uh, Western Asia. So they did come over here, but people have been keeping bees in this area for uh, over 300 years, but only now within the last five years are towns starting to make it very difficult legislatively. And, and as I say, this is radiating out from Boston. Our, my friends in Western Massachusetts, uh, you know, don't understand this at all and think it's crazy. Um, and also, I, I want to repeat that right now, we don't have specific beekeeping regulations in Lexington, and hope, hopefully we don't. Um, in Belmont, for example, they have, uh, we worked with them and we got a, an excellent uh, legislation that's fair to all parties and when they have a problem they call me in and I go over there and, and mediate between the neighbors and so far that's worked very well so hopefully it can be done. Um, here's an image of um, one of the growing problems for beekeepers. I'll give you a minute I guess I can't hear you uh, speak but um, if I could, I would say, what do you think this is? What happened to this apiary? Okay, if you answered bears, you're correct. And here is a uh, chart of bears between the 1970s where we had 100 bears in the state. And um, I only go up to 2016 where we've got thousands of bears. And within the last few years, uh, we have bears even in Lexington now. They haven't crossed Route 95. They're still over in the Turning Mill area. Um, but they've got bears in Concord, and the bears are starting to, to come here. And, and that is a big, big problem because they are relentless. And if you have bears, you can add another at least 500 bucks to put up an electric fence. And my, my friends who live in Western Massachusetts literally can't keep bees without putting up an electric fence around their apiary. And this is your typical one. It uh, runs on solar power, uh, but it's a big nuisance. I have right now um, about 16 different locations around Lexington with a, 16 different apiaries. An apiary is a place where beehives are kept. So in this picture, that's one apiary. Um, and if I had to put electric fences around them, that number would quickly go down to just two or three. So right now it's nice because there's you know, lots of different gardens and neighborhoods that have 
flowers thriving because of the bees, but you, it, it just gets cost prohibitive if you have to put electric fences around every beehive. Okay, so if you're with me so far and you haven't tuned out and said, this is crazy, it's expensive, it's difficult, and you know, I haven't even mentioned getting stung, uh, which isn't a big deal to me, um, and you're still interested in keeping bees, here's what I suggest. Be cool. Go to bee school. And every spring, you know, as I said, beekeeping is like gardening. You have, uh, you start up in the early spring, you get your bees and the hives grow and thrive and pull in nectar. And in the fall, you can take some honey off and then they're dormant in the winter till the next season. So, Almost every county in Massachusetts and, and in other states as well have county beekeeping organizations. And the first thing to do if you're interested in beekeeping is to join your county organization. Here in Lexington, we're in Middlesex County. So we have the Middlesex County Beekeepers Association, which is wonderful, very smart people, a lot of uh, newbies in there. So we're teaching all the time and most of the counties run a bee school. And Middlesex County does, what I've posted here is the um, syllabus for the Essex County Beekeeping Association. Um, I am a member of Essex County just to support their work. They are wonderful people and every year they kill themselves to run the best bee exhibit, in my opinion, in the whole country at the Topps Field Fair. Um, I don't know if we're gonna have a Topps Field Fair this year, but they have a whole bee building and they have observation hives and exhibits and they have crafts for children made out of beeswax. And if you have any interest in beekeeping, go. They put on the best show of any county fair and I've been to Iowa and I've been to lots of state fairs uh, and it's also the oldest in the country. They do a great job, and I joined Essex just to support them in this. They also run a bee school, and you can see on the dates of this, it starts February 21st, and they all start around there. Uh, so the county organizations run them. Sometimes community education runs them as well. We also have here in Massachusetts a great um, uh, company called The Colony, I think it may also be called New England Beekeeping up in Tingsboro. They run a bee school as well. That's about half an hour up Route 3. Rick Ralt does a wonderful job, very experienced beekeeper. Um, and, and that's really what you have to do. And this is where you really will learn how to start your own hive. Uh, the courses take about eight weeks and one night a week and you go and you, you find out things and then you buy your bees and you start up in the spring. Uh, one other place that I should mention where I learned to keep bees is Drumlin Farm in Lincoln. Uh, back in the 70s when I started, I had just learned to drive and I would drive out to Drumlin Farm in Lincoln and, and there was an old farmer from Concord who's not with us anymore, but um, he taught me how to do it. I originally thought it was gonna be a biology you know, let's learn about the bee. And then I realized it wasn't. So I paid, back then, I paid $15 for a package of bees and a queen, um, which would cost you $150 now. So um, times have changed. But um, so that's, that's how to get started. Uh, why it's very difficult to do, so don't do it unless you're willing to commit a fair amount of time and effort and money to do it. Uh, but there are benefits. It's, it's a wonderful hobby. I've really enjoyed it in these, uh, this difficult spring we've had. It's wonderful to be out in nature. Uh, nobody stops me because agriculture is an essential business. So, you know, I'm free to go where I want and promote the bees and, and keep the, um, the honey coming in. I have lost my the places that I generally sell honey, which are the Visitor Center and Firefly Moon gift shop downtown are closed. So I, I can't do that for a while, but um, I do sell wholesale in Lexington. Um, so these are things that you can do if you're willing to go through it. So those are the basic considerations. And 
Uh, if you have any questions as I'm talking, please feel free to let Ashley know she's the moderator. Um, and I'll go on to tell you uh, some of the history of beekeeping in Massachusetts and some a little bit of the biology of the bee, what you might see in your hive. Alex, since we're right on the subject now, what about doing it the other way, such as I have done, that you hire somebody to keep the bees for you? Like you're keeping the bees for Carla uh, at the Victory Garden, and I have somebody keeping bees for me at my place. Can't people who want to keep bees do that also? Well, yes. If you're in Lexington or close to Lexington, you can hire me and my daughter. We right. have a private beekeeping service, right. uh, and we do everything. Just like um, I think you use Best Bees in Boston, you can uh, call them, and they will put the bees in your garden. You have all the benefits. You get some honey from your hive, and you don't have to do a thing. It just and you get beautiful flowers. You just Right, and, and you get the, uh, yeah, not, o not only, you know, I should mention that Carla does a great job and, and my friends who have bees in their yard will testify that the produce explodes once you yeah. have them. Uh, but that's also true of the flowers. Flowers and flowers are classified as angiosperms and the flowers and the bees um, evolved together over 300 million years to where they are today. You know, you don't have, almost all flowers are pollinated by bees. Not, not all of them, you know, some of them are pollinated by wind or bats or other things. Um, but 80% of the flowers, almost all your flowers that are in the garden club are pollinated by bees. So the more bees you have, the more flowers you have and Unfortunately, uh, because of some of the problems that I showed you before, we've lost most of our feral bees and also other pollinators. Mm -hmm. I have the long view uh, in Lexington. My family moved here in 1968, and I've lived here in Lexington on and off uh, for my whole life. And, um, so I've seen, you know, back in the 70s, that was before uh, Scott's developed the broadleaf weed killer. All of the lawns had clover in them and dandelions, which are incredibly nutritious for bees and other pollinators. And now, um, you know, I live on Fallen Road and, and in my neighborhood, you are your lawn. Um, you know, I, I try to educate people to let these um, small herbs and flowers grow, the, the, you know, most people don't like dandelions, but a lot of people let the clover do, and there's tons of clover in my lawn, uh, but a lot of people don't. They don't want to see anything other than a monocrop of grass, yeah. which is a desert for all wildlife. Right. Um, you know, maybe a cow eats it, but none of the pollinators can get any nutrition, nor can the wildlife. Right. So uh, one of the things that I've been doing is developing a bee lawn and um, trying to let all of the flowers grow. And that's the number one thing. If you're just interested in promoting pollinators, grow as many flowers as you can. If you don't want to keep bees, but you want to do something good for the environment, you can either, you know, as you say, hire me or hire best bees. I think we're the only two doing it in this area to keep the bees for you so you don't have to go near them or just plant gardens so that the pollinators have food because that's that's one of the biggest challenges. I didn't put that on on the challenges but it is. You know if you've lived here for decades you know that Lexington used to have far more open space and fields and dandelions and clovers and, you know, less uh, totally manicured lawns than we have now. Um, right. So, you know, pollinators, I have allium, um, which bees absolutely love, and uh, echinacea, and there's a whole list. You know, I gave a lecture to the Garden Club about two years ago about all the flowers that are very pro-pollinators. And, but, you know, al almost anything that you, you plant is going to be pro-pollinator. That's right. Very important. Now, I interrupted you. Go on with your history. 
Yeah, no, no, uh, no worries. Um, one of the things that uh, right now I've got L.L. Langstraw on the screen. And in 1860, one of the things that makes Massachusetts special is uh, that we had L.L. Langstraw from Deerfield, Massachusetts. And before Langstroth, everybody kept bees in a skep. That's the, the picture you see on, on the left. It, it looks like a basket. And the bees lived there. And they did absolutely fine there. But when you want to harvest the honey, uh, you have to kill the bees and, and pull them out of the skep. Langstroth was a reverend in Deerfield. In 1860, he discovered what's called bee space. And we are all using the Langstroth 10 frame hive now. He found a way uh, of having the honeycombs in separate frames, usually 10 in a box, and you can take them out and, and uh, take the honey out and, and put them back in and reuse them all the time. Uh, Beeswax is incredibly expensive metabolically. It takes about 20 pounds of honey for a bee to make one pound of beeswax. Wow. So if you can keep reusing that beeswax and not kill the bees, you can make far more honey than you ever could. And in 1860, Langstroth figured that out. And now all over the world, that's the standard. And that's right here from Massachusetts. So... Here is, I, I took this image from the internet. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, bee supply companies, and there are several. And uh, I also heard that you know, one, of, one of the byproducts of COVID, you asked me whether more people are, are keeping bees now. Uh, this spring, the bee supply companies were selling out. So I guess the answer is yes. Yeah. A lot more people are, are keeping bees. I also heard that you can't adopt a dog anymore. So anything that you uh, do to amuse yourself at home is probably selling out. But this is your basic starter kit. And uh, you can see, um, I guess I can't make that larger, but um, this Great. is, that, there's a beehive and your two basic tools are there as well. There's a smoker uh, for reasons that aren't completely well understood. Smoke calms bees and makes them not want to sting you. So you, you smoke them. Bees communicate with pheromones, which are chemical signals. Uh, so when you put the smoke on them, they can't communicate. They don't uh, realize that you're there or they don't send the pheromone that says there's an intruder sting her. Um, so it's much easier to work with your bees. And then on the top of that box, there's a hive tool, which is like a little pry bar because the bees use propolis, which is a product from pine trees to seal all the cracks in their hive and you have to pry apart the, the hive. And there's a veil, which uh, you always want to wear. It's no fun getting stung on the face. Um, here's a couple of other hives. So let, let me say right from the start, if you're thinking about keeping bees, a hundred percent, I recommend going for the traditional Langstroth hive. It's the easiest for the bees and it's easier for you. But uh, because there are some other types on the market, I'll, I'll show you. And, and one that has recently become more popular um, is the, the hive on the left, which is a long hive and the, the frames, it's only one box tall. Uh, and this came from Africa. In my opinion, it's not good for this climate. It's very good if you live in a hot climate, but we don't. And, and the only way that you can harvest the honey in this is to crush up the comb and strain it. So you have to ruin your beeswax to get that. Um, the one on the right is a Warre hive, which is kind of a strange hybrid of a Langstroth hive and, and uh, the, the trough, and it has 10 frames in it, um, but several different layers. It's an odd hybrid. Forget about it. I have friends who use it, but it's a specialized thing. Don't use it. Um, 
Okay, feel free to interrupt me if there's any questions, Ashley. I'm just going to keep talking okay. so and, I will. Till, uh, and feel free to type questions in the Q&A. We can either interrupt or uh, answer them all at the end. But anybody who has yeah. a question, you can just click the Q&A button and type there. Yeah, Q&A is good. If you don't feel like speaking, feel free to chat on the Q&A um, button. Uh, okay, so here's, there's a couple of ways, now if, if you're going to uh, continue this and, and buy bees, here's a couple of ways to get your bees. There's two basic ways that your bees can come. Um, this is packages of bees and the other is a nuke and I'll show you the nuke in a minute. This is the least expensive way and so this is the way uh, most beginners choose to start. Don't do it. Um, what you're looking at is a row of um, each, each one of these boxes with a divider down the middle is a package and you can see these silver uh, discs on the top. That's a can of sugar syrup to feed the bees while they're in transit and you can actually get these through the mail. The U.S. Post Office will deliver packages of live bees and they come in these boxes, which is about the size of a box of Cheerios, um, but it's a screen on both sides and it's full of bees. And then there's a little cage next to the can of sugar syrup with a queen bee in it. Each colony has one queen bee and all these workers and then the, the sugar syrup to feed them. <laughs> and if you get them in the mail, which I have done, um, you'll get a call from the post office saying, um, we have your bees here, um, Mrs. Barge, could you come down right now, right now? Don't worry. I know we're not open, but don't worry about it. Just come around the back and come in the back door, not the front door. Uh, and, you know, they, they, uh, some, sometimes they even send me to the, uh, the sorting facility on Spring Street. They don't even let it go as far as the Mass Ave post office. Um, <laughs> But you, you get these. Now, the reason I'm telling you don't do it, I think I have, I think the next shot, yeah, here's a better shot. Uh, this is one package, and you can see that metal can is sugar syrup. It has a couple of holes poked in the bottom so that the bees will be sucking the sugar syrup on it. And, and then the, um, let's see if you can see that, that's the queen cage. Um, the other side, you, you can't see the queen um, for the way this is taken, but the screen uh, is on the other side and has one queen bee in there. And, and then you let the queen bee, uh, you dump this whole thing in your hive, which is ready. And you can see the little mailing label on the top. So this one did go through the mail. Uh, the problem is that our season is so short here in Massachusetts. You know, we're so far north that we have a very short season. And these guys have to start from nothing and build a whole colony and get as much honey as they're going to need, which is about 75 pounds of honey, which they're going to need for the winter. So uh, it's a tall order. And most of these, um, I, my, my friends who are in the business and who work for the state apiary inspector give me um, comments on the side, but I would guess between 80 and 90 of these do not survive the winter. Mm. Most of them, definitely most of them die. And that's a lot of time and money and expense to end up with one summer and then the, the bees die. So uh, that's why I say don't do it. Oh, here's another picture when, you, when your package comes you literally dump it out like a box of Cheerios into the hive. You put the queen in, in the queen cage in the middle. And when I talked about um, the 10 frame Langstroth hive, you can see if you're looking at the top of this picture, each one of those crossbars is a frame, like a picture frame that has a honeycomb going from one end to the other. And then the bees use that honeycomb to start baby bees and uh, brood and store honey in there. And so now you're dumping it out. Now the queen has to start laying eggs and it'll take her a few days to start laying. And then when she starts laying, it takes 21 days 
for a queen to lay an egg and that egg to hatch into a baby bee. So you've, got, you've lost three weeks right there from the get-go. And with a few days uh, before she starts laying, basically you've lost a month. Now you know how long the gardening season is here and how long our summer is. A month is too long to waste in our climate. So this is what I recommend. This is the more expensive option, uh, but it's cheaper in the long run. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. This is a nuke. Um, also, you can say a nucleus hive, but most of us call it a nuke, N-U-C. And you can see this is, um, this is actually a pretty large nuke. I think this may be one of mine. Usually they have five frames in them. This one, you know, if you count the frames, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six frames uh, in this nuke. And then there's an entrance over here on the left. Yeah, that's mine. I can see my foot right there. Um, and when you buy the nuke, I think the latest prices, um, I generally buy mine from uh, New England Beekeeping because they give me good high quality uh, nukes. And um, I think I was paying, I think I paid about $200 for the last one. So it's not cheap. But when you get this, you can kind of see um, a little bit on top here, you can see some of the honeycomb. When you get this, you have a queen in there who has been laying eggs for weeks. So oh. you not only get the adult bees, but you have eggs and you have um, all the stages that you, you, a queen lays an, uh, an egg and it's an egg for three days and then it's a larva which looks like a little grub for eight days and then it's um, a capped pupa for 10 days and then it hatches and you'll get all of that so you'll have all of these bees in the pipeline uh, ready to start and going to work and uh, the bees getting the nectar in the summertime bees only live for about a month and it's only the last four or five days of their lives that they're out gathering nectar in the flowers so when you see a bee on your flower in your garden that bee is about to die that's the last thing she does in her life and it's basically a death sentence she will live less than a week and that's it. Alex, how many bees are in that approximately? In that new? Um, in, oops, I don't know how to go backwards. Okay. Shoot. That's all right. Uh, I think if you just use the left, the left and right arrow on your keyboard, it might do it. Oh. Okay. Um, you also have a Bear with question me. that in, came in to whenever you're ready. Yeah, I see it. Yep. Thank you, Matt. Okay, in, um, in the package, you get three pounds of bees. Uh, I'll just go through these quickly. In your package, you get three pounds of bees, and there are 3,000 bees in a pound. Oh, Don't ask me. <laughs> So each one of these packages has 9,000 bees. That has 9,000 bees in it. That's fantastic. Okay. Yep. Um, we have another and, question. And the nuke will have um, probably about 10 or 12,000. It'll have more. Ah, so it really is worth that money, um, the extra price. Oh, it definitely is. Yeah. But the nuke have a fi far better survival rate over the first winter. Right. You know, I, I mentioned that the, the packages, almost all of them are going to die mm -hmm. over the, the first winter. And that's a very demoralizing thing to happen to a new beekeeper. You know, you grow attached to your bees, you name your queen, some people name their hives. <laughs> and at the end of it, it you end up, you know, you, you put all this blood, sweat, tears into your, your hive and they die. Yep. I uh, the sad. nucleus hive. Uh, I, I don't have figures for the survival rate, but it's far higher. Okay. Uh, in, in fact, I have, bees in general, you know, this is another thing you should know. Um, they do surveys of beekeepers throughout the nation. 
bees are the third most important animal in United States agriculture, coming only after right. um, cows and chickens. Right. And uh, they're incredibly important, which is one reason that I'm very interested in inspiring young people, because it's critical for our food supply that we have bees. Yeah. And so the, you know, the Department of Agriculture does surveys, and the latest one indicated that 40% of bees in the United States died over the winter. Now, can you imagine if 40% of the cattle died? Um, you know, we declare it a, a national emergency. Yeah. And what we do as beekeepers is we'll take our, our old hives and split them and, you know, add new queens and make more. But that, that's kind of hard on the bees because you're splitting up this population. Right. Um, and different beekeepers have different, you know, survival rates depending on where you live, how far north. And uh, because I've been doing it for a long time, I have a very high survival rate. This past winter, I had 100% survival rate because we didn't have a really hard winter this past winter. Right. No, we didn't. Um, but there have been other years. I, I think um, you may remember, was it 2018 where we had record-breaking snow? Right. Um, almost everybody lost everything. Right. Uh, I didn't. I, I was okay. But a lot of the new, almost all the new beekeepers lost their bees. So it's, you know, it's a very difficult thing. But these nukes, if you use these, they, they will uh, do, do much better. Very, that's interesting. Now we have one more question and we're running short on time here. So Okay, I, I can stop anytime. Hans wants to know, how far do bees travel from their hive typically? An average of three miles. Okay. And um, that, that's the, the rule of thumb. But in fact, they go as far as they need to go. Um, if you're a commercial beekeeper, you know, we have in, in Massachusetts, I have a friend who runs an apiary called Merrimack Apiaries in Billerica. And he's one of the largest beekeepers in America. He runs 40,000 colonies and he trucks them around on flatbeds right. doing the uh, almond pollination in California. And he does the cranberries down on the Cape and the blueberries up in Maine. And when you go to a place um, where you've got, you know, a crop like that, a monocrop uh, of say the almonds, um, they won't go three miles. They have all the food they need within an acre and they'll just stay there. On the other hand, bees who might live uh, in New Mexico where there's a desert, they'll fly 10 miles to get to a flower. If there's fewer flowers, you know, they'll just go as far as they want. It's obviously very hard on the bees to have to go that far. So but, if you have um, a garden full of nice flowers for them, they could be very happy staying with you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's another reason, you know, it's, it's so much easier on the bees if you have a neighborhood full of dandelions and clover and they don't have to fly, you know, halfway across town to get there. Another thing that's really great here in Lexington is that um, someone in our town fathers planted these wonderful linden trees. My favorite one is right in front of Buckman Tavern and has a beautiful octagonal bench around it. And when these things bloom, they just bloomed a couple of weeks ago, they'll have thousands and thousands of beautiful white uh, and cream colored flowers all over them. And every pollinator in town is on these flowers. You'll see bumblebees and, and native bees and wasps and honeybees, and they'll bring in a huge amount of uh, linden tree honey. I have another yeah. question here. Uh, for maximum benefit, what flowers and plants can I plant in my yard to help the bee population? Also, can you have well, knives in the neighborhood? Uh, the answer to the flower question is um, almost anything. I mentioned a couple. Um, they love alliums. They love echinacea. They love coreopsis. Um, I love cranes build uh, geraniums. There's a fabulous, I, I don't know, actually you may know the uh, Cranes Bell Geranium Roxanne. It was perennial of the year a couple of years ago. It's a beautiful blue, blooms all summer long, and every single day my bees are on it. So that's my favorite perennial. Um, but almost everything. And right around now we're just starting to get a goldenrod. It's almost the goldenrod and asters in the fall are incredibly productive. 
yeah. for bees. You know, they tend to be more wildflowers. Yeah. Um, so al almost everything, and you can you can Google it and find lists yeah. of uh, different flowers. So there's a huge production. And the answer to can you have too many bees in a neighborhood? The answer is yes. Uh, if you're in a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of flowers and you put, you know, 25 hives in there, um, then the bees won't get enough honey. And, and you know, I can see it. I, I've got my bees spread all around Lexington and, and I can see, you know, some of my apiaries always do great and some don't. And it's not necessarily just where there's less development. Sometimes um, I keep bees in an, in an apiary that's surrounded by woods and they're just, you know, with the tall trees, there aren't that many flowers. So it's not as productive as say my apiary on Cotton Farm, which is on Merritt Road, which is yeah. surrounded yeah. by meadows yeah. and wildflowers. And you just see acres of these beautiful wildflowers when you drive by. Yeah. Maybe we should look for areas the garden club can plant those other areas that don't have them enough flowers and stuff for you. Yeah, well, ju just like the garden club does the, the median strips right. um, around town, they, they put the most wonderful flowers there. And I'm sure my bees are there right now. That's, you know, these are the things that Lexington is, is a truly wonderful town. And, and one of the reasons that it's wonderful is that people really care about having flowers and, and beautiful areas and, and agricultural land around. So it's a great place for bees. Right. Now we should quick go through this before we get shut off here. Because these okay. are pictures. Um, all right, yeah, I, as I say, you, you can stop me anytime. I'm just adding a little bit of information. These no, are no, the three- awesome. You're full of information, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I can talk for days. Um, these are the three type of bees that you'll find in a hive and uh, there's generally one queen and she lays all the eggs and in the springtime when she's really trying to beef up the population she will lay 3,000 eggs a day in the hive one one per cell in the honeycomb uh, the worker bees do all of the work they do everything that needs to be done and every time you see a bee on a flower that's a worker and these are the female bees. Um, the male bees are the drones, and they have one function, which you may be able to guess. Um, the function of a drone is to have sex with a queen, and that's all he does. And in this climate, where uh, we don't have any flowers in the wintertime, when the fall comes, the worker bees will literally drag the drones out of the hive and throw them out because they're only, they, they, they'll keep the drones around for the summer when things are plentiful, but when things get scarce, hit the road, Jack. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, this is a nice picture of um, a beehive and these, the orange arrows, uh, this is a honeycomb. Honeycomb, by the way, um, you know, the, the guys down at MIT studied the honeycomb and, and it's an incredibly strong um, substance for the amount of wax in honeycomb. It holds an enormous amount of weight in honey. Uh, one of those deep frames of, of honey is about six pounds and it has almost no wax in it. It's very thin you know, the hexagon is a very strong architectural design and it's used for holding honey and it's also used for baby bees. And you can see these tiny little white spots that the arrows are pointing to. That's an egg. That's what the uh, queen bee has just laid an egg and it'll be an egg for three days. These are all worker bees tending it and uh, then it'll hatch into a larva. And that's my last slide. That's uh, where I am right now, sitting at my desk, and behind me is an observation hive, which I uh, like to bring around and, and show young people. I set it up in my parents' living room every summer, and they show all the neighborhood kids down at the Cape. Um, it's the, uh, the piece of glass right here in the window. The bees go out the window, and you can watch them bringing in honey and, and having baby bees and watch the queen going around. Queens, by the way, 
Um, if you've ever seen a queen with a colored dot on the back, that's how we beekeepers keep, uh, keep track of the bees. There's a color code for different years. So you know a queen can, can live for up to three years. And so that you know how old the queen is, you put a dot on her back, and this year it's blue. There's a color code that goes white, yellow, red, green, blue, and then back to white. So next year we'll be putting white dots on our queens. This year we're putting blue dots on. So. So um, how do I know what direction to put my hive? Well, the rule of thumb is that um, you want to put the entrance facing south. And I have violated that, and you can violate that. It's not a big deal. But if, you pit, if you know, you've got three sides and you've got the entrance uh, on one side, and um, locating, a hide is, locating the hive is a science in itself. You want a place that's out of the wind, in the sun, facing south and uh, then the Massachusetts Beekeepers Association has a some best practices as well so that you know you want to keep it away from the sidewalk because for about 10 feet from the entrance you know it looks like O'Hare Airport especially on a day like today they're all taking off yeah. you don't want to have that going over your property line or interfering with somebody else um, so you want to have that in for you from your property line but but if you can, it should face south so that the morning sun comes down and warms the entrance. Oh, okay. And as for the winter, what happens then? In the winter, um, the bees go into kind of a suspended hibernation. They form a cluster in the center of the hive with a queen on the inside and they vibrate. You know, they're cold blooded, so they're not creating any heat but they do eat the honey and they vibrate to keep a certain amount of heat there and keep themselves alive. And they drop the uh, temperature in the hive down to, I think around the forties. When, when they're hatching brood, they'll make the inside up to 93 degrees, which is the temperature for hatching brood. But um, until the winter solstice, they're not hatching any brood and they'll drop the they'll drop it down and they don't fly, obviously. There's no place to go. And I was told to be careful to keep the snow away from the entrance. And leave some air to get in there when the snow's got too deep. That's not necessary. It's not necessary. Yeah, in fact, uh, generally the, the hives do what's called sometimes uh, chimneying, is that the heat of the hive will melt um, uh, an area around it so that you won't have snow there. but you know, if it's warm enough for the bees to fly, they'll be okay. Also, generally, the Langstroth hive has a small upper entrance, about the size of a quarter, so that they use the upper entrance in the wintertime. You don't, you definitely shouldn't, in fact, you should not shovel out your hive because snow is a good insulator, especially on those days when it goes down below zero. Interesting, very interesting. Um, so, uh, you have certainly given us a very informative, interesting, talk on bees. There's obviously a lot to learn. And you can obviously work with Alex, or you could do it on your own and go study. But I think there's a lot there. As a gardener, I know what a difference the bees have made in my garden. I have great swaths of color now. And the vegetables, just what happened with Carla, they've doubled in production. It is amazing what can happen. Um, so I advise you you have an expert here, right here in town. She really understands it. I thank you for speaking with us today, Alex. Um, and thank you all. Thanks, for Ashley. Can, can I add one, one more point? Um, and I, I appreciate uh, everything you say. One of the other things that I do for the county is I'm the swarm coordinator. And it's particularly if you're a gardener like you, Ashley, um, if you see a honeybee swarm, they won't happen now. They generally happen in the spring, in April, May, and June. Um, you can Google me, but if you see a swarm in Lexington or anywhere in Middlesex County, um, they are very unlikely to survive in the wild, but uh, there are many beekeepers. I'm the swarm coordinator, 
and you can reach me and then I farm it out to one of the beekeepers in whatever town you happen to be in and we can save those bees. Uh, so something to think about next spring if you ever see a swarm of bees in your garden. Even how many bees die and how hard their life is these days. Yes. Save those bees. Is so important. Yep. Okay, thank you, Alex. Okay, thanks, Ashley.